Part Two of Chapter Five of The Abandoned Room. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Abandoned Room by Wadsworth Camp. Chapter 5, Section 2 The Crying in the Woods A vague discomfort stole through Bobby's surprise. He had never heard Peretti speak so seriously. In spite of the man's unruffled manner, there was nothing of mockery about his words. What, then, was their intention? Peretti said no more, but for several minutes he paced up and down the hall, glancing often with languid eyes toward the stairs. He had the appearance of one who expects and waits. Catherine, Graham, and the doctor, Bobby could see, had been made as uneasy as himself by the change in the Panamanian. The doctor cleared his throat. His voice broke the silence tentatively. If this house makes you so unhappy, young man, why do you stay? Paredes paused in his walk. His thin lips twitched. He indicated Bobby. For the sake of my very good friend, what are a man's personal fears and desires if he can help his friends? Graham's distaste was evident. Paredes recognized it with a smile. Bobby watched him curiously, realizing more and more that Graham was right to this extent. They must somehow learn the real purpose of the Panamanian's continued presence here. Paredes resumed his walk. He still had that air of expectancy. He seemed to listen. This feeling of eminence reached Bobby, increased his restlessness. He thought he heard an automobile horn outside. He sprang up, went to the door, opened it, and stood gazing through the damp and narrow court. Yet, he confessed, he listened for a repetition of that unearthly crying through the thicket rather than for the approach of those who would try to condemn him for two murders. Paredes was right. The place was unhealthy. Its dark walls seemed to draw closer. They had a desolate and unfriendly secretiveness. They might hide anything. The whirring of a motor reached him. Headlights flung gigantic distorted shadows of trees across the walls of the old wing. Bobby faced the others. They're coming, he said, and his voice was sufficiently apprehensive now. Graham joined him at the door. Yes, he said, there will be another inquisition. You all know that Howells, for some absurd reason, suspected Bobby. Bobby, it goes without saying, knows no more about the crimes than any of us. I dare say you'll keep that in mind if they try to confuse you. After all, there's very little any of us can tell them. Except, Peretti said with a yawn, what went on upstairs when the woman cried and Howells's body moved. Of course I know nothing about that. Graham glanced at him sharply. I don't know what you mean, but you have told us all that you are Bobby's friend. Quite so, and I'm not a spy. He moved his head in his grave and dignified bow. The automobile stopped at the entrance to the court. Three men stepped out and hurried up the path. As they entered the hall, Bobby recognized the sallow, wizened features of the coroner. One of the others was short and thick-set. His round and florid face, one felt, should have expressed friendliness and good humor rather than the intolerant anger that marked it now. The third was a lank, bald-headed man whose sharp face released more determination than intelligence. I am Robinson, the district attorney, the stout one announced, and this is Jack Rawlins, the best detective I've got now that Howells is gone. Jack was a close friend of Howells, so he'll make a good job of it, 
but I thought it was time I came myself to see what the devil's going on in this house. The lank man nodded. You're right, Mr. Robinson. There'll be no more nonsense about the case. If Howells had made an arrest, he might be alive this minute. Bobby's heart sank. These men would act from a primary instinct of revenge. They wanted the man who had killed Silas Blackburn principally because it was certain he had also killed their friend. Rawlins' words, moreover, suggested that Howells must have telephoned a pretty clear outline of the case. Robinson stared at them insolently. This is Dr. Groom, I know. Which is young Mr. Blackburn? Bobby stepped forward. The sharp eyes, surrounded by puffy flesh, studied him aggressively. Bobby forced himself to meet that unfriendly gaze. Would Robinson accuse him now, before he had gone into the case for himself? At least he could prove nothing. After a moment, the man turned away. Who is this? he asked, indicating Graham. A very good friend. My lawyer, Mr. Graham, Bobby answered. Robinson walked over to Paredes. Another lawyer, he sneered. Another friend, Paredes answered easily. Robinson glanced at Catherine. Of course, you are Miss Perrine. Good. Coroner, these are all that were in the front part of the house when you were here before? The same lot, the coroner squeaked. There are three servants, a man and two women. Robinson went on. Account for them, Rawlins, and see what they have to say. Come upstairs when you're through. All right, coroner but he paused at the foot of the steps. For the present, no one will leave the house without my permission. If you care to come upstairs with me, Mr. Blackburn, you might be useful. Bobby shrank from the thought of returning to the old room, even with this determined company. He didn't hesitate, however, for Robinson's purpose was clear. He wanted Bobby where he could watch him, Graham prepared to accompany them. If you need me, the doctor said. I looked at the body. Oh, yes, Robinson sneered. I'd like to know exactly what time you found the body. Graham flushed, but Catherine answered easily. About half past two, the hour at which Mr. Blackburn was killed. And I, Robinson sneered was aroused at 3.30, an hour during which the police were left out of the case. We thought it wise to get a physician first of all, Graham said. You knew Howells never had a chance. You knew he had been murdered the moment you looked at him. Robinson burst out. We acted for the best, Graham answered. His manner impressed silence on Catherine and Bobby. We'll see about that later. Robinson said with a clear threat. If it doesn't inconvenience you too much, we'll go up now. In the upper hall, he snatched the candle from the table. Which way? Catherine nodded to the old corridor and slipped to her room. Robinson stepped forward with the coroner at his heels. Bobby, Graham, and the doctor followed. Inside the narrow, choking passage, Bobby saw the district attorney hesitate. What's the matter? The doctor rumbled. The district attorney went on without answering. He glanced at the broken lock. So you had to smash your way in. He walked to the bed and looked down at Howells. Poor devil, he murmured. Howells wasn't the man to get caught unawares. It's beyond me how anyone could have come close enough to make that wound without putting him on his guard. It's beyond us as it was beyond him, Graham answered. How anyone got into the room at all. In response to Robertson's questions, he told in detail about the discovery of both murders. Robinson pondered for some time. Then you and Mr. Blackburn were asleep, he said. Miss Perrine aroused you. This foreigner, Paredes, was awake and dressed and in the lower hall. I think he was in the court as we went by the stairwell, Graham corrected him. 
I shall want to talk to your foreigner, Robinson said. He shivered. This room is like a charnel house. Why did Howells want to sleep here? I don't think he intended to sleep, Graham said. From the start, Howells was bound to solve the mystery of the entrance of the room. He came here hoping that the criminal would make just such an attempt as he did. He was confident he could take care of himself, get his man, and clear up the last details of the case. Robinson looked straight at Bobby. Then Howells knew the criminal was in the house. Howells, I dare say, Graham said, telephoned you something of his suspicions. Robinson nodded. He was on the wrong line, Graham argued, or he wouldn't have been so easily overcome. You can see for yourself. Locked doors, a wound that suggests the assailant was close to him. Yet he must have been awake and watchful, and if there had been a physical attack before the sharp instrument was driven into his brain, he would have cried out. Yet Miss Perrine was aroused by nothing of the sort, and the coroner, I dare say, will find no marks of the struggle about the body. The coroner, who had been busy at the bed, glanced up. No mark at all. If Howells wasn't asleep, his murderer must have been invisible as well as noiseless. Dr. Groom smiled. The coroner glared at him. I suggest, Mr. District Attorney, he squeaked, that the ordinary layman wouldn't know that this type of wound would cause immediate death. Nor would any man, the doctor answered angrily, be able to make such a wound with his victim lying on his back. On his back, Robinson echoed. But he isn't on his back. The doctor told of the amazing alteration in the positions of both victims. Bobby regretted with all his heart that he had made the attempt to get the evidence. Already complete frankness was impossible for him. Already a feeling of guilt sprang from the necessity of withholding the first-hand testimony which he alone could give. And a woman cried, Robinson said, bewildered. All this sounds like a ghost story. You've more sense than I thought, Dr. Groom said dryly. I never could get Howells to see it that way. What are you driving at? Robinson snapped. These crimes, the doctor answered, have all the elements of a ghostly impulse. Robinson's laugh was a little uncomfortable. The Cedars is a nice place for spooks, but it won't do. I'll be frank. Howells telephoned me. He had found plenty of evidence of human interference. It's evident in both cases that the murderer came back and disturbed the bodies for some special purpose. I don't know what it was the first time, but it's simple to understand the last. The murderer came for evidence Howells had on his person. Bobby couldn't meet the sharp, puffy eyes. He alone was capable of testifying that the evidence had been removed as if to secrete it from his unlawful hand. Yet, if he spoke, he would prove the district attorney's point. He would condemn himself. Curious, Graham said slowly, that the murderer didn't take the evidence when he killed his man. I don't know about that, Robinson said, but I know Howells had evidence on his person. You through, coroner? Then we'll have a look, although it's little use. He walked to the bed and searched Howells' pockets. Just as I thought, nothing. He told me he was preparing a report. If he didn't mail it, that was stolen with the rest of the stuff. Rawlins is right. He waited too long to make the arrest. Again Bobby wondered if the man would bring matters to a head now. He could appreciate, however, that Robinson, with nothing to go on but Howell's telephone suspicions, might spoil his chances of a solution by acting too hastily. Rawlins strolled in. The two women were asleep, he said. The old man knows nothing beyond the fact that he heard a woman crying outside a little while ago. I don't think we need bother about the back part of the house for the present, 
Robinson said. Howell's evidence has been stolen. It's your job to find it unless it's been destroyed. Your other job is to discover the instrument that caused death in both cases. Then maybe our worthy doctor will desert his ghosts. Mr. Blackburn, if you will come with me, there's a slight possibility of checking up some of the evidence of which Howells spoke. Our fine fellow may have made a slip in the court. Bobby understood and was afraid. More afraid than he had been at any time since he had overheard Howells catalog his case to Graham in the library. Why, even in so much confusion, had Graham and he failed to think of those telltale marks in the court? They had been intact when he had stood there just before dark. It was unlikely anyone had walked across the grass since. He saw Graham's elaborate precautions demolished, the case against him stronger than it had been before Howell's murder. Graham's face revealed the same helpless comprehension. They followed Robinson downstairs. Graham made a gesture of surrender. Bobby glanced at Paredes, who alone had remained below. The Panamanian smoked and lounged in the easy chair. His eyes seemed restless. I shall wish to ask you some questions in a few minutes, Mr. Paredes, the district attorney said. At your service, I'm sure, Paredes drawled. He watched them until they had entered the court and closed the door. The chill dampness of the court infected Bobby as it had always done. It was a proper setting for his accusation and arrest. For Robinson, he knew, wouldn't wait, as Howells had done, to solve the mystery of the locked doors. Robinson, while the others grouped themselves about him, took a flashlight from his pocket and pressed the control. The brilliant cylinder of light illuminated the grass, making it seem unnaturally green. Bobby braced himself for the inevitable donument. Then, while Robinson exclaimed angrily, his eyes widened, his heart beat rapidly with a vast and wondering relief. For the marks he remembered so clearly had been obliterated with painstaking thoroughness, and at first the slate seemed perfectly clean. He was sure his unknown friend had avoided leaving any trace of his own. Each step in the grass had been carefully scraped out. In the confusion of the path there was nothing to be learned. The genuine surprise of Bobby's exclamation turned Robinson to him with a look of doubt. You acknowledge these footmarks were here, Mr. Blackburn? Certainly, Bobby answered. I saw them myself just before dark. I knew Howells ridiculously connected them with the murderer. You made a good job of it when you trampled them out, Robinson hazarded. But it was clear Bobby's amazement had not been lost on him. Or, he went on, this foreigner who advertises himself as your friend. He was in the court tonight. We know that. Suddenly he stooped, and Bobby got on his knees beside him. The cylinder of light held in its center one mark, clear and distinct, in the trampled grass. And with a warm gratitude, a swift apprehension, Bobby thought of Catherine. For the mark in the grass had been made by the heel of a woman's shoe. Not the foreigner, then, Robinson mused. Not yourself, Blackburn, but a woman, a devoted woman. There's something to get after. And if she lies, the impression of the heel will give her away, the coroner suggested. Robinson grinned. You'd make a rotten detective, coroner. Women's heels are cut to a pattern. There are thousands of shoes whose heels would fit this impression. We need the soul for identification, and that she hasn't left us. But she's done one favor. She's advertised herself as a woman, and there are just three women in the house. One of those committed this serious offense, and the inference is obvious. Before Bobby could protest, the doctor broke in with his throaty rumble. One of those, or the woman who cried about the house, Bobby started. 
The memory of that eerie grief was still uncomfortable in his brain. Could there have been actually a woman at the stagnant lake that afternoon and close to the house tonight? Some mysterious friend who assumed grave risks in his service. He recognized Robinson's logic. Unless there were something in that far-fetched theory, Catherine faced a situation nearly as serious as his own. Robinson straightened. At the same moment, the scraping of a window reached them. Bobby glanced at the newer wing. Catherine leaned from her window. The coincidence disturbed him. In Robinson's mind, he knew her anxiety would assume a color of guilt. Her voice, moreover, was too uncertain, too full of misgivings. What is going on down there? There have been no, no more tragedies. Would you mind joining us for a moment? Robinson asked. She drew back. The curtain fell over her lighted window. The darkness of the court was disturbed again only by the limited radiance of the flashlight. She came hurriedly from the front door. I saw you gathered here. I heard you talking. I wondered. You knew there were footprints in this court, Robinson said harshly that Howells connected them with the murderer of your uncle. Yes, she answered simply. Why then, he asked, did you attempt to obliterate them? She laughed. What do you mean? I didn't. I haven't been out of the house since just after luncheon. Can you prove that? It needs no proof, I tell you so. The flashlight exposed the ugly confidence of Robinson's smile. I am sorry to suggest the need of corroboration. You doubt my word, she flashed. A woman, he answered, has obliterated valuable testimony. I shall make it my business to punish her. She laughed again. Without another word, she turned and re-entered the house. Robinson's oath was audible to the others. We can't put up with that sort of thing, sir, Rawlins said. I ought to place this entire household under arrest, Robinson muttered. As a lawyer, Graham said easily, I should think with your lack of evidence it might be asking for trouble. There is Paredes who acknowledges he was in the court. All right, I'll see what he's got to say. He started for the house. Bobby lingered for a moment with Graham. Do you know anything about this, Hartley? Nothing. Graham whispered. Then you don't think Catherine... If she'd done it, she'd have taken good care not to be so curious. I doubt if it was Catherine. They followed the others into the hall. Bobby, scarcely appreciating why at first, realized there had been a change there. Then he understood. Robinson faced an empty chair. The hall was pungent with cigarette smoke, but Paredes had gone. Robinson pointed to the stairs. Get him down, he said to Rawlins. He wouldn't have gone to bed, Graham suggested. Suppose he's in the old room where Howells lies. But Rawlins found him nowhere upstairs. With an increasing excitement, Robinson joined the search. They went through the entire house. Paredes was no longer there. He had, to all appearances, put a period to his unwelcome visit. He had definitely disappeared from the cedars. His most likely exit was through the kitchen door, which was unlocked, but Jenkins, who had returned to his room, had heard no one. With their electric lamps, Robinson and Rawlins ferreted about the rear entrance for traces. The path there was as trampled and useless as the one in front. Rawlins, who had gone some distance from the house, straightened with a satisfied exclamation. The others joined him. Here's where he left the path right enough, he said, and our foreigner wasn't making any more noise than he had to. He flashed his lamp on the fresh footprint in the soft soil at the side of the path. The mark of the toe was deep and firm. The impression of the heel was very light, Paredes, it was clear, had walked from the house on tiptoe. Follow on, Robinson commanded. 
I told this fellow I wanted to question him. I've scared him off. Keeping his light on the ground, Rawlins led the way across the clearing. The trail was simple enough to follow. Each of the Panamanian's footprints was distinct. Each had that peculiarity that suggested the stealth of his progress. As they continued, Bobby responded to an excited premonition. He sensed the destination of the chase. He could picture Paredes now in the loneliest portion of the woods, for the trail unquestionably pointed to the path he had taken that afternoon toward the stagnant lake. Hartley, he said, Paredes left the house to go to the stagnant lake, where I fancied I saw a woman in black. Do you see? And he didn't hear the crying of the woman a little while ago, and when we told him he became restless. He wandered about the hall talking of ghosts. A rendezvous, Graham answered. He may have been waiting for just that. The crying may have been a signal. Perhaps you'll believe now, Bobby, that the man has had an underhanded purpose in staying here. I've made too many hasty judgments in my life, Hartley. I'll go slow on this. I'll wait until we see what we find at the lake. Rawlins snapped off his light. The little party paused at the black entrance of the path into the thicket. He's buried himself in the woods, Rawlins said. They crowded instinctively closer in the sudden darkness. A brisk wind had sprung up. It rattled among the trees and set the dead leaves in gentle, rustling motion. It suggested to Bobby the picture which had been forced into his brain the night of his grandfather's death. The moon now possessed less light, but it reminded him again of a drowning face, and through the darkness he could fancy the trees straining in the wind like puny men. Abruptly the thought of penetrating the forest became frightening. The silent loneliness of the stagnant lake seemed as unfriendly and threatening as the melancholy of the old room. There are too many of us, Robinson was saying. You'd better go on alone, Rawlins, and don't take any chances. I've got to have this man. You understand? I think he knows things worthwhile. The rising wind laughed at his whisper. The detective flashed his lamp once, shut it off again, and stepped into the close embrace of the thicket. Suddenly Bobby grasped Graham's arm. The little group became tense, breathless, for across the wind, with a diffused quality, a lack of direction, vibrated to them again the faint and mournful grief of a woman. End of chapter 5 Section 2 of The Abandoned Room